for those of you. Okay. Um, for those of you that are new here, I am Marina Papa Nicholas. I'm the business um, director here at the chamber. With us, we have Denise Santora. She's our director of communications. Um, Danielle is on vacation today. So um, uh, welcome to our strategies for success. Um, today, it is a um, great honor to introduce Scott Bliss from uh, Sandler Training, which he will speak to us, Seven Secrets of Top Performing Sales Professionals. So um, I will mute myself and Scott, please take it away. Awesome. I will do that. Guys, thank you. i um, been a longtime chamber member. Very happy to, to be here. Um, today's all about you guys. It's, it's very educational. I don't necessarily want it to be um, 40 minutes of just lecture or anything like that. So we definitely want to make it conversational and we will absolutely uh, leave some time at the end to uh, answer any questions that you might have. And we can even answer questions as we go along should they come up. But what we're doing today is uh, we're going over the uh, seven secrets of top performing sales professionals. Sandler Training is a sales and management training organization for those of you who are not familiar with Sandler. We've been doing this a long time and uh, we definitely are able to notice uh, what elevates people to higher levels of performance, higher than they can even uh, believe that they can achieve. So before I get started, I kind of just like to open up to, to a question where I'm going to uh, write down on my whiteboard some of the, uh, the responses that we get. So if I were to say to you, thinking about yourself, if you're a salesperson, or your team, if you happen to run a team of salespeople, I have pretty good salespeople, or I am a very good salesperson, if only I can get better at one, two, or three things. What comes to mind? And what I'm looking for really is from a personal perspective, a sales process perspective, uh, not things like I wish marketing gave me better leads or I wish we had a better CRM. But if you ask yourself that honest question, and I just wanna maybe get a list of four or five of them to start, I could become a better salesperson if only I can improve upon this, that, or the other. Anything coming to mind, you can just shout them out, I'll, uh, or you can put them in the chat, but I'll write some down as we do it. What comes to mind? You're on mute, Cindy. I see your lips moving, but. <laughs> I would say prospecting. Prospecting, ah, yes. Everybody loves prospecting, sure. Okay. Prospecting is one, a great one. Better organization. Organization, kind of like time management, maybe territory management stuff, right? Uh, so I'll call it TNT management. Okay, awesome. What else? Anybody else have anything they want to add to it? Strong silent types. I like it. <laughs> Okay. I'll throw in a second vote for the prospecting side, Scott. That's that's kind of the big one, I think. Yeah. Okay. So when we say prospecting, are we talking about uh, finding the right people to talk to, or doing a better job of qualifying the the people that we're speaking to, or a combination of both? What do you think? I mean, personally, I think it's a combination of both. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. All right. Usually what I get when I ask this question, a lot of people say, I wish I can close better or uh, I wish I could qualify better or I wish we could ask better questions. Um, I wish uh, I can convince people more. So we're going to talk a lot about these things because one thing sales isn't, um, sales is not convincing. It's not your job to convince somebody to buy from you, right? It's your job to find out what their needs are, what their pain is and then see if you can offer a solution to, to that need or to that pain. Uh, here, if you can't see my slides, by the way, go over to gallery view and click on speaker view and you'll be able to see the slides nice and big. But um, I'm gonna just call on somebody, uh, Lynn, Lynn Schaefer, what do you see in this picture? You're asking the wrong one because I'm on a phone and I can't pull it up very big right now. Mm -hmm. No I see problem. snow. It's like it's a guy lost in the woods in the snow. A guy lost in the woods in snow. Sarah, Sarah, what do you see? 
Um, I see a bear. A bear. A dog. A dog. Okay. A dog. I like that. <laughs> Victoria, what do you see? I see the bear also. Like it looks like it's on his jacket. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So really, what this actually is, and if you really look at it closely, this is a dog walking out of the woods. Oh my goodness. It is a dog walking out of the woods. Usually though, when I show this picture in some of my sessions, it's like 50-50. Some people see the dog walking out of the woods. Some people see a man with a backpack walking into the woods, right? This first time I heard a bear. So thank you for that. I'm going to add that now to my, uh, you know, two of you said bear, which is pretty cool, right? Anybody guess, I'm a sales trainer, right? Uh, we're talking about sales process today and, and how to become better at selling. Anybody guess, you know, where this fits in? Why am I showing this picture? Perspective, viewpoint. Of who? Of the sales person. How do you see your, how do you view the situation? How do you view your, your client? How do you view the situation? That, yeah. that was, I drew a parallel between the statement you made before, Scott, about seeing their pain as opposed to seeing our solution first, right? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And when we talk about a selling interaction, okay, there's dueling agendas. There's conflicting agendas. You as the salesperson have one agenda. You want to position your product or service and be successful. Your prospect or your client has another agenda, right? They have needs. They want to make sure that potentially your product or, or service fits their needs, right? So you might see different things. You might see different things. They have, they see things one way, you see things another. And the reason why I showed this picture, quite frankly, is because most salespeople go into every selling interaction with the mindset of, I am here to sell something. I am here to pitch you my product or service. And I am here to talk about features and benefits of my product and service and how it can help you, right? Whereas what salespeople really should be doing is having the mindset of, I don't know if my product or service is a good fit for you. I need to ask you a bunch of questions to find out exactly what it is you're looking to accomplish. What are you looking for? Then I need to make a determination does what I have fit in with what you're looking for? So there's a difference there between pitching and understanding. So I, I stole this part from Stephen Covey. Uh, he wrote a bunch of books. One of them, you know, the, the eight habits of uh, most successful people. I forget the exact title. But one of the things he said is we must seek first to understand. And that is our job as salespeople. We must seek first to understand. And it's almost like uh, you want to question like a doctor. You want to question like a doctor. So uh, let me pick somebody here, uh, Cindy. Cindy, um, you, you hurt your shoulder over the weekend. Uh, and um, two or three days later, it's not getting any better. So you call up your doctor, you make an appointment, you know your doctor. So, you know, you're on a, you know, a personal basis with him, but you're sitting in the in the office, in the room, and he walks in. And typically, after he walks in and says, hey, Cindy, good to see you, what's generally some of the questions he's going to ask you? You're on mute, Cindy. By the way, that was the number one saying in 2020 during the major part of the pandemic, uh, when everything went virtual. The number one uh, phrase repeated was, you're on mute. <laughs> uh probably the first question would be so what happened how did you hurt hurt yourself absolutely absolutely what, what brings you in here today how'd you hurt yourself right and then what else might he ask you must say i hurt my shoulder right and he'll say how'd you do it you'll tell him he'll say when did this happen you'll say friday or saturday but what else what might he ask you about how's your pain level pain um, level um, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's going to ask you, how's your pain level? He might even ask you, what have you tried to do about it? Where you might say, you know what? I put a little heat on it, put a little ice on it. I took some Tylenol, 
right? And he's going to say, well, how does that make you feel? Did it give you any relief? You're going to say, probably not. That's why I'm here to see you, right? So before he can really fully diagnose a, a solution for you, a treatment plan for your pain, he's got to ask you a lot of questions. He's got to pull out of you a lot of information. Everybody agree with that? Right. He's not just going to say, oh, you hurt your shoulder playing basketball with your kids. OK, here's a here's a script for a muscle relaxer. Uh, try this for two weeks and uh, uh, give me a call back if it doesn't work. No, he's going to need more information. That doctor might even say, you know what? He's going to examine you a little bit. He's going to ask you more questions. He might even need an X-ray or an MRI or a CAT scan. But what he's looking to do to give you the best diagnosis that he can give the best treatment plan, he needs more information. He needs a lot more information. So he's going to pull that information out of you, right? Then once he has all the information, he can make a determination as to what the true diagnosis is for your pain and how to fix your pain, how to solve your pain. And that's what the best salespeople do. Best salespeople do that. So before I go into the seven rules uh, or, you know, the seven secrets of top performing sales professionals, I want to give you a few things of, of background here um, that we notice that the best salespeople, the ones who are just a little bit better than everybody else, they are consistent in what they do differently. And one of the first things that they do the best salespeople do is they adapt. They adapt to each and every individual prospect. Right? And when we say adapt, we call it in the sales world, building a rapport, building bond, building a bond, building trust. And the way you do that, you do that on a lot of psychological levels that you haven't even thought about. Pre-COVID, when people would see you regularly, people would think building rapport is going into their office, having a few commonalities. Maybe you know a couple of the same people. Maybe uh, you see that they're a Yankee fan. Or they have a picture of a Yankee player on the wall. I'm a Yankee fan. You start talking about the Yankees, right? People try and build rapport around that. Well, guess what? Anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Your competitors can do that. The best salespeople adapt to each and every individual prospect on a psychological level. They learn to do that with behavioral profiles like DISC. They learn to do that with something called neurolinguistic programming, which really is matching and mirroring. You're matching their posture. You're matching their body language. You're matching the way they're speaking, whether they're a speaking in a high tone, a lower tone, you're matching and mirroring them. If they're sitting back and relaxed, so are you, right? Because at the end of the day, people buy from people that they like, people buy from people that they trust, and people buy from people that are like them. So adapting to those, your individual prospects, you as the salesperson, you get paid to adapt to your prospect. They do not get paid to adapt to you. So it's your job to adapt to your prospects. So the best salespeople do a much better job at adapting to their, their prospects, right? The second thing the best salespeople do, they qualify hard. They qualify hard. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Christina, Christina Popes, what's easier? What do you think is easier to do, qualify an opportunity or close an opportunity? What's easier? Um, maybe close, I guess, because qualify, you're asking a lot of questions, um, you know, getting information and then closing might be the harder one. Right. Got it. Okay. Connor, what do you think? I would have to go with, um, I would say also qualify. Cause I mean, that would probably be a little more difficult just cause you're pulling all that information together and you have to think on the spot when, when you're closing is you make that final argument of tying every, all the information together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 100% qualifying is much harder than closing because if you're qualifying hard, if you're qualifying stringently and asking all the right questions and uncovering the right uh, pain and not just pain indicators, but going really deep into pain, questioning like that doctor, right? you're qualifying every step of the way. So when you come to the close, you've already done all the hard work. So the close should be easy. If you're doing it the right way, the close should be easy. So the best, best salespeople adapt to each and every individual prospect. They qualify hard. And the, the reason, the win for you in qualifying hard is really your job is to disqualify that prospect. That's your job because there's so many opportunities out there for what you do, 
right? And prospecting, we mentioned prospecting earlier. Prospecting is like a scavenger hunt. We are always on the lookout for the right person at the right time for the right reasons, right? And when we talk about that, when we talk about prospecting, we as salespeople, from a time management perspective, a territory management perspective, we have to figure out who is our uh, our best uh, prospects to continue the conversations with, right? Are we spending the right time, right, in our areas of highest potential? So selfishly, we need to qualify, qualify, I'm making up language here. We need to qualify or disqualify as quickly as we can. And we have to ask the right questions and able to do that, right? And we're going to go into that. Because we have to make that decision. We're only going to work hard on the opportunities that we know we have a pretty good chance at closing. So we need to collect that information for us, right? The other thing that the best salespeople do better than everybody else is they overcome way more objections, right? The pretty typical objections we get in the normal selling role. We need to think it over. We need to form a committee. I need to talk to my boss, I need to talk to my wife. I need to talk to my husband. Standard stalls and objections. The best salespeople are able to talk through it and really find out exactly what that means. And I don't know about your world, but I know in my world, nine times out of 10, a think it over means no. A think it over means no. Tim Davis, why do you think, though, they don't tell you no, that they tell you they need to think about it? Why do you think that might be? Well, Tim might be doing something else. Mark, Mark Ramos, why do you think they, they won't tell you no? They tell you they need to think about it, even though it might really mean no. Well, they're just not convinced that, you know, uh, you, didn't, you didn't convince them. Whether it's a service or a product, maybe it's, a, maybe it's the cost of it. You know, they just don't believe in it. Yeah. Yeah, either it doesn't fit for them, which means we didn't do a good enough job really understanding their pain, right? Or they just don't want to tell us no because they don't want to hurt our feelings because they're thinking, you know what? This person came in, just spent 45 minutes with me, told me all this great information about their product or service, right? And, and I don't want to hurt their feelings and tell them no. So I'm just going to tell them I'm going to think about it and hope that they never contact me again, right? And then you send them those emails. Hey, I'm just checking in. Hey, I just want to follow up, right? And they're ignoring them because they figure, you know, I'll just ignore him and he'll eventually go away, right? And, and one thing I want you to, to understand here, when you have a really good sales process, whether it's Sandler or something else, when you have a really good sales process, you will, you will develop the ability to remove uh, an illness that we call justitis. Anybody, else, anybody here of the word, the illness justitis before? A client yesterday told me they call it circulitis. So whatever it is, justitis or circulitis, here's how that works. You leave a meeting, you do a great job of educating that prospect, right? and then you find yourself over the next coming days and weeks and months constantly sending an email. Hey, I'm just checking in. Hey, I'm just circling back with you. You don't get a response. Then you send them a voicemail. Hey, I just want to see if you've made that decision yet. Hey, I, I wanted to circle back with you to see what's the next steps. And we're getting what we call ghosted, right? If you follow a good process the right way, your process, you can eliminate the words just and circle from your sales vernacular. Because again, if you do it the right way, you're not going to have to constantly send those follow-up emails and you're not going to constantly have to chase. And here's why. Okay? There's something that we call equal business stature. And Equal business stature is when you see yourself as an equal in the relationship and you professionally assert your right to have open and honest communication. And a lot of times in the sales world, people, uh, salespeople put their prospects up here on a pedestal and they put themselves right below that prospect. They almost feel subservient in a way because they know they want that prospect to buy from them. So they're going to answer all their prospects questions. They're going to give them samples. They're going to send them a quote. They're going to give them all the information with the hope and the belief that if they do a good job, the prospect will buy from them, right? 
Equal business stature basically means you're there for a reason. So are they. Your job is to uncover why you're there. You uncover why you're there. See if you have a solution for their pain, because that's why you're there, to find out what their pain is. Right? And once you find that, that you can potentially solve that solution, you have further conversation, which we'll, we'll talk about how you do that. Right? But equal business stature. Don't put your prospect on a pedestal. You need to make sure you leave every selling interaction with the pertinent information that you need. It's not just your job to educate. Sell today, educate tomorrow. Right. Any questions so far before we continue? When we educate, we usually get in a little bit of trouble and I'm gonna to jump to this slide real quick. Cute little puppy dog, right? With the big old ears, right? I call this happy ears and salespeople get happy ears a lot. And happy ears happens when a prospect shares a little bit of information with you and it kind of like opens the door for us to think that they're a potential, they're a good potential for us. So we get excited. And when we get happy ears because we think we got one, it's kind of like fishing. You put your, you bait your hook, you throw your, your, your cast your line in the, in, in the water and you feel a little nibble, we get excited. And what is the amateur fisherman? Any fishermen, any people fish on the call here? Anybody fish? Cindy, you fish? So what happens when you feel a little nibble on the line? Well, the anxious people just just pull on it, but you're supposed to wait till that real big hit and then you hook them. Yeah, absolutely. The the amateur fisherman or fisherwoman, right? She feels that, they feel that nibble and they start reeling it back in. I got one, they're nibbling, I got one. The professional fishermen, right? They know that that nibble is just the beginning and they have to resist the urge to pounce. And what they do is they want a strip line, we call it, strip line. Give that fish more line, right? Release more line on, on your fishing rod because you want to give that fish more time to set themselves on the hook. So when you reel it in, you don't lose it, right? So happy years happens when salespeople think they have an opportunity, they bypass their system, their process, and they jump right into sell, sell, sell mode. I'm going to impress you with my product knowledge, Right? I'm going to uh, educate you and then hope that you buy from me. And then they're surprised when they get ghosted, when they're not getting the information that they need. Right? So we want to avoid happy years at all costs. That's our goal, to avoid happy years. Right? Set the hook. Don't, don't go and pounce right away. Right? What we find in, in the sales world is usually there's two roadblocks with salespeople. Right. The first roadblock is technical. Technical meaning they don't really know what to do. They've never had sales training. They just have really good personalities. They like people and they like talking to people, but they've never really been trained and that's okay. The other roadblock is conceptual. Maybe they've been trained. They know what to do. They just feel really uncomfortable doing it. Anybody have a guess? What's something that it's involved in our sales world that makes people uncomfortable to talk about? Price. Price. Why, Cindy, let me ask you a question. Why does that make you uncomfortable? Or why do you think it could make potentially most people uncomfortable? Because I, I, I mean, with me, with my customers, they have a, a, a budget in mind. And when they see something they like, then it's, it's, I always get the opposition. Well, that's way over my budget, but then it's my job that now to show why qualify that piece of furniture or what, that item, why it is more expensive than what they were ready to spend. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of salespeople are very uncomfortable talking about budget. And a lot of prospects are afraid to share with you their budget because they think the second that they share their budget, now you got one up on them and you're probably going to come in right at that budget. Maybe you would have been less, right? But people are uncomfortable talking about money because depending on the, the generation you grew up in, I grew up in a generation where, 
you know, I remember at, a, at the dinner table once when I was a kid asking my father how much money he made per year. Before my father can even answer, my mother jumped right in and said, that's none of your business. We don't talk about money. You don't ask your father those kinds of questions, right? So people, we have internal recordings inside us from a psychological perspective that when we were a kid, we learned these things, right? And it transfers over to us in an adult life. Let me give you an example. Here's a simple one. It's not sales related, but what do you do when you cross the street? Right? We look both ways. I think I saw you mouth that, Sarah, right? Uh, <laughs> I'm a good lip reader, right? Um, we look both ways. We learn that at a very young age, right? When, when you were a kid and you, were, you said to your parents, I'm going to the beach with my friends. I'll be back later. What's something, what's a message, an internal message maybe that your mother gave you as a kid when you were going to be gone all day, not within her eyesight? What's one of the things she might have said to you? Any guesses? Now, I'm looking around. It's a little bit of a, well, for those that I can see, maybe a generation or so younger than me. But I know this is something my parents used to say to us all the time. What's something they would say to you when you, you were a kid, when you'd leave home? Be careful. Be careful? Be careful why, Mark? What did they not want you to do? Talk to strangers. Don't talk to strangers. Let me ask you this question. What is sales? Talking to strangers. Sales is talking to strangers. So you <laughs> said earlier, we want to learn how to prospect. <laughs> well, there's a conceptual block with a lot of people with prospecting because it involves different things like cold calls or maybe cold emails or asking for referrals or introductions or doing work on LinkedIn. But you know what? I'm not comfortable doing it because my, my parents told me as a kid, don't talk to strangers. And some of you might be looking at me right now saying, dude, you're crazy. That has no bearing on it. It's got a lot, psychologically speaking, got a lot of bearing on it, right? So I want to talk about something called the buyer-seller dance, right? The buyer-seller dance is basically a game. It is a game that uh, prospects and salespeople um, have. And really, when you think about a dance, there can only be one leader to the dance, right? That person who's leading the dance, they control the tempo, they control the area of the floor that's covered. They control when the dance starts, when it stops. They control when they dip you, lift you, twirl you, right? But if you think about it, if two people are trying to lead the dance, it's not a dance. It's a wrestling match. There's no gracefulness about it. So when you think about your selling interactions, it's like that dance. People are fighting for control. And salespeople have their system. Prospects have their system. And I'm going to show you a little bit now why it conflicts. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it'll make my point. Because depending on who's leading, if the prospect is leading the dance, then you're going to fall into their system. And you're going to do a lot of educating. And you're going to do a lot of work. And you might not get anything in return for it. Right? Because when that prospect is leading, right, they're only going to give you the information that they want to give you. And they're going to ask you for a lot of information. And because we get happy ears, we're more than happy to give that information because we think if we don't give it, we're not going to get the opportunity. So when that prospect is in control, we're trying to sometimes present solutions to undefined problems or we're trying to close way too early in the process. And then we end up chasing and wasting a lot of time chasing. Right? So the typical seller order, when you're a salesperson, and I'm not saying this is for everybody, but when you're a salesperson, you know, we, we conduct some type of needs analysis or we generate interest. We feel like there's a need. If it's furniture, they're in a furniture store, they're looking for furniture, they obviously need something. If I'm going to Ralph's store, I probably need some type of appliance, right? So right, right away, we assume that there's a need that they have that we can meet. So we do that needs analysis. After we do that needs analysis, we typically go right into presentation or proposal mode, right? They tell us they're looking for this. We tell them all the features and benefits of our product and service because it's our job to sell something, right? So we call that the show up and throw up. That's when we start regurgitating all the features and benefits about our product lines and about our service and why we're so great and how long we've been in business and our quality and our delivery and our customer service and all that stuff. Right? We're throwing all that up. Right? So we go right into that presentation mode. Then after we do that, we try and close them. 
what do you think? You're ready to place an order. You know, what are next steps? Maybe you ask some good questions, but we're ready to close them, right? And then typically what ends up happening is we'll get those typical stalls and objections. We need to think it over. I need to talk to my wife, need to talk to my boss. We need to form a committee. And then we leave it at that. And then we're typically in follow-up mode. We're typically in follow-up mode. And the reason why this happens is because we're falling into the prospect system. The prospect has developed their own system as a defense mechanism to the traditional selling process. Because everybody loves to buy, but nobody likes to be sold, right? So their typical buying orders, they express interest, right? And they act motivated. And the reason why they do this, they know if they express interest and they act motivated, we're going to give them everything they want. We're going to share our information with them. We're going to try and sell them, right? So they're, that's what they want from us. That's what they want us to do, right? After they act motivated, their job is to obtain information. So we're falling right into the palm of their hand. They're sitting there congratulating themselves and patting them on the back because you're doing the show up and throw up, giving them everything that they need because that's their job. That's what they're looking for. Then they're going to avoid any type of commitment whatsoever. And then they're going to go into what we call hide mode or disappear mode. And when you look at this, this is how it kind of cancels out each other. And this is the buyer seller dance right here, right? They express interest and act motivated. That's enough of a needs analysis for us. Their job is to obtain information. We jump right in and give them what they want, whether it's pricing, whether it's specs, whether whatever it is, right? We try and close them. They avoid commitment. We try and handle their objections. They disappear on us. We chase them. Just checking in, just following up. Just want to see where we stand with the process. Have you made a decision yet? Right? So what this tends to lead to is an educated buyer and a frustrated salesperson. Right? Because what we end up doing a lot of the times is we do unpaid consulting. We do unpaid consulting. And that's something that we don't necessarily want to do unless we have it properly qualified properly qualified, right? So now I want to talk about the seven secrets to top performing sales professionals, right? This is what we're going to segue into right now. The first two secrets are all part of what we call building the relationship, building the relationship. So secret number one, build that bond, build that rapport, build that trust, we mentioned it earlier, the best salespeople adapt to each and every individual prospect, right? That's your job. I'm not saying become their best friends, right? We're, we're not into sales to get our needs met, ultimately. The end goal is to get our needs met financially to do a good job selling and make money, right? But our job is to build that rapport, build trust, and, and get them to trust us because people buy from people that they like, people buy from people that are like them, people buy from people that they can trust. Our goal is to become trusted advisors and not just a vendor. And when you become a trusted advisor, there's many benefits to that. Any, anybody care to guess what are some benefits to becoming a trusted advisor versus just a vendor? Any guesses? You grow your business with them and that's going to ultimately lead to referrals for you because they're going to share how happy they are. Bingo. Absolutely. When you're that advisor, not only are you going to grow with them, but you're going to ask them for referrals. And sometimes they might even just give you referrals, but you always want to make sure you ask for them. Right. You should go back to all your happy clients today and ask for referrals. That's the easiest way to warm up a lead. Talk about prospecting. How can we prospect better? Go to your happy clients, ask them to introduce you to other people. Right? The second benefit to what Victoria just said is if you're a trusted advisor, guess what? They will many times pay more money for your product or service, even though they might be able to get it cheaper elsewhere. Sometimes that it's not worth it for them because you're there for them. You're, you're not just a vendor. They're not just buying from you because you're the lowest priced. 
One race we never want to win is the race to the bottom. You never want to be the cheapest supplier. I mean, if that's your game, if that's what you want, and you're going to win everything on price, then that's your business model, and that's okay. That's your decision. But ultimately, if you become that trusted advisor, you build that bond, you bring value, they will pay more for your product or service. Bottom line is this. If you fully understand their pain, fully understand it, and you can solve it, they're going to pay more for your product or service. Right? So step number one, secret number one, building that bond, building that rapport, adapting to each and every individual prospect that you talk to. You get paid to adapt to them. They don't get paid to adapt to you. Secret number two is a technique called the upfront contract. The upfront contract in its simplest terms is an ironclad agenda that your prospect agrees to before you even meet. And essentially, there's five elements to the upfront contract. You're, it's like an agenda, but it's more. Right. So an upfront contract, you're setting the expectations for the meeting. This is what's going to occur. Right. So if I'm meeting with Victoria to talk about sales training for her team. Right. I'm going to say, OK, Victoria, we, we as we've discussed, we're going to meet Tuesday at two o'clock. Uh, and I'm going to say, Victoria, typically my meetings take about one hour. Are you OK with that time frame? She'll probably say yes. No problem. Great. I'm going to come to your office. We're going to meet for an hour. Victoria, I know you're going to have a ton of questions for me. You're going to want to learn about how our process works, what's involved. You're certainly going to ask us about level of investment, right? How much money you're going to have to invest in the program. We'll be happy to answer those questions for you. I'm going to have questions for you as well, Victoria. I want to learn a little bit more about you and your team, what you've done up to this, why you need our help, where your struggles are. Right? And at the end of the hour, when at about the 55-minute mark, I want to stop. And I want to be able to discuss together potential next steps, right? And next steps could look like this, Victoria. You can either say, yes, we're ready to move forward. Or you can say, no, I don't think it's a good fit. Or you might say, you know what, Scott, this sounds great. We need to set up another meeting and I need to bring in our, our president or these people and we need to take it from there. And then you schedule that next meeting. But what you're not going to do is leave that meeting with, yeah, give me a call in a couple of weeks. Or let me think about it. You're going to learn how to avoid that and how to not do that and how to not settle for that. So that's what that upfront contract enables you to do. It adds control and predictability to all your meetings. And what you're also doing there is you're giving your prospect permission to tell you no. Most salespeople won't do that because they're afraid they're going to get the no. A no is pretty much the second best thing you can hear on a, on a sales call if you get it early in the process. Where no stink is when you waste a lot of time, effort, energy, and resources, and you get it way on down the path. And that still might happen. You might qualify an opportunity perfectly and still not win, and that's gonna happen, right? But your job, a successfully trained salesperson is going to do the right things to either qualify or disqualify their prospects early in the process. Right? So that upfront contract, bonding and rapport all goes towards building that relationship. Secret number three, four, and five relates to qualifying the opportunity. And this is right here where the, uh, the rubber hits the road. Every good salesperson needs to spend a lot of time in the qualification process because this is where your money's made. This is where your value is brought. Okay. We have to find pain. Secret number three, understanding pain. Understanding pain. And if I were to ask you, Angelo, if, uh, um, if somebody said to you, uh, my, my pain is bad service from the competitor, would, would you think that that's pain? Bad service? Is that good pain? Yeah. It's, 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 it's bad service is, is, is they're not coming back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, but but you got to put your money where your mouth is. If you tell them you're going to you know, do better than your competitor, you need to be able to step up and and provide that great service. Right. And I would agree with that. But the only thing that I'll disagree with there is bad service is pain, but it's more of what we call a pain indicator. Basically, it's indicative of a much greater pain. 
And the best salespeople use great questioning techniques and great questioning strategies that a good sales training program will teach them on how to ask these difficult questions. But it's our job, like that doctor, my shoulder hurts, great, here's a prescription, call me in two weeks. No, it's tell me a little bit more about it. Uh, uh, these service issues, uh, what does that mean when it happens? Right? When, when you get bad service, what does that mean for the rest of your employees? What, what, what else happens? If you don't fix this, what happens to you? type thing. So we want to take pain to the third degree. We want to understand what, what that pain really means, how it's affecting the organization, how that bad service is affecting the organization, how that bad service is affecting them personally, right? And, and is doing nothing an option. Is doing nothing an option. Can you live with, you know, this bad service all the time? Or are you really motivated to make a change? And by the way, what if that change costs you more money? Is it still that big of a problem? Right? You have to get comfortable asking these difficult questions and really going deep into pain before you can determine whether or not you can help them. So pain, we have a, a rule at Sandler, no pain, no sale. Right? And there's different, there's different pains. There's different pains. There's immediate pain, pain in the present. Right now, they need to fix it. Or there's a fear of pain in the future that it's not an emergency right now, but they know they have to fix it moving forward. Or it doesn't necessarily always have to be pain. It could be pleasure, right? Buying from you might make it a more pleasurable experience either today or a more pleasurable experience in the future. So there's four buying emotions, pain in the present, pain in the future, pleasure in the present and pleasure in the future. You have to figure out what buying emotion you're selling to. Right, so secret number three, three is really getting confident and being able to have good conversations around pain. Secret number four, you've identified that pain. You've gone into detail about that pain. And when you get really good at it, you can put associate dollars to pain, how much that pain is costing them, right? So after you do that, now you're gonna have a budget conversation, a preliminary budget conversation, right? Because you now need to understand, can they afford your solution? Not only can they afford it, are they willing and able to pay for it? Right. So you have to have these difficult, uncomfortable conversations. People don't like talking about money, but this is where you have this conversation, because if they don't have the money for it or can't come up with the money for it, it's disqualified. What, what else is there to do? Hope. Yeah. You know, I'll send you a quote and hope maybe that you can come up with the money. Right. So we have to have that budget conversation. That's that's secret number four right there is being comfortable talking about money. The best salespeople are comfortable talking about this. Secret number five, decision. Once you've identified that pain, that you can solve it, that they can afford your solution and they're willing and able to pay for your solution, now you need to be cognizant of their decision-making process. Where is it made within the organization? Who's involved in making that decision? Why is it done that way? When is it going to be made? What's the timeline looking like? If this was a yes, when are we going to start implementing if this is a yes, when should we expect the purchase order, right? So really getting comfortable having that decision conversation, right? And not just saying, I would never sit down with a meeting with Angelo and, and say, so Angelo, um, are you the decision maker, right? Because depending on the tonality I use, when we talk about communication and bonding and rapport, right, that could come off as a critical parent tonality. Are you the decision maker? But instead, I want to use more of a nurturing parent tonality, and I might say, um, Angelo, can you, um, can you share with me how decisions like this are made within your organization and who's involved in making them? So now I'm just asking questions in a really good nurturing tonality because sales is all about communication and human relations. That's what it is, right? So secret number five, understanding the decision process. Secret number six, fulfillment. This is where you make your presentation. And this is where you make what we call your presentation for the kill. You are now presenting the solution to their pain and nothing else. The solution to their pain. In the traditional selling that we discussed earlier, where did we present? Who remembers what step did we present? Step two, right? We did it really early. We qualified. We we thought there was a need maybe. So we went right into presentation or proposal. We went right into, this is why we're better than our competitors. This is who we are, right? This is what we can do for you. Send me a quote. Sure, I'll send you a quote, 
in the Sandler selling system, we're not presenting until step six. That's secret number six. We are only presenting a solution to a pain that we can solve. We're presenting much later. Now we know what to present. If when you're presenting in step two, you don't really fully understand their buying motives yet. You don't understand their pain. Right? We call that premature presentation. Secret number seven after fulfillment is what we call the post sell. Very difficult for a lot of salespeople to do. The post sell basically is eliminating buyer's remorse. If you're replacing an incumbent supplier, um, and let's say you've identified a good pain and so on and so forth, um, you know, and they say, you know what, Scott, give me a call on Monday and we'll start the implementation. Great. Call him up on Monday. I get his voicemail. Hey, Angelo, Scott, what's in? Hey, I'm just checking in. And then you told me to call you on Monday. I don't hear from Angelo on Monday. Tuesday, I call him again. Angelo, Scott, just circling back with you. Um, I know you said to call you yesterday. Don't, don't hear from him. I'll send him an email. Angelo, just checking in. Just itis, right? Circleitis. Hey, wait a minute. I, I return my call, Scott. <laughs> you do. You did to me. I know. Um, but I'm, I'm just using it as an example, right? So now Wednesday comes. I don't hear back from Angelo. And I'm now saying to myself, I'm not going to send him an email. I'm not going to call him because I don't want to become a pest. I don't want to become a sales pest. Equal business stature, people. A mosquito is a pest. Bugs are pests. You exterminate them. You try and kill them. Salespeople are not pests. If you do your job the right way and follow a good, strong process, whatever it is, Sandler or your own or another company, follow a good, strong process. And if you do it the right way, you're not going to have to think of yourself as a pest because you're going to set the outcome each and every time. That upfront contract is going to set the outcome. Angelo, I'll call you on Monday like you asked me to. Let's open up our calendars, get the time on the calendar now so we're not chasing each other. Angelo, let's say I call you on Monday during our proposed time. What happens if you don't answer? What would you like me to do? Right, all these questions, right? Because Angelo might come back to me on Friday and say, you know what, Scott? Yeah, I know I told you to call you Monday. When I called up ABC Company and told them that we were leaving them, they they really wowed us with some changes that they were going to make and they, they made it more cost effective for us to stay with them. So we're just going to stick with the devil that we know and we're just going to stick with them. And Angelo would never say this, but he's thinking, he's going to say, hey, thank you for helping me negotiate a lower price with my current company. Right? So we want to be able to prevent it against that, what we call that buyer's remorse, right? Um, and the fulfillment and post sale part, that's obviously secrets number six and number seven, right? So a couple of philosophies I'll share with you before we end it and open it up for questions. We at Sandler believe that selling, professional selling is a very noble profession. There's some sales careers out there that um, have given negative connotations to sales positions. Okay, but it's a very noble profession. I know a ton of salespeople that make a heck of a lot more money than doctors and lawyers and accountants and, and, and executives, right? You do your job the right way. It is a very noble profession. Your job as a salesperson is to find their pain, understand their pain, offer them a solution to their pain, right? And that's your job. And if you can do that, you will be successful. And then you will be looked upon as a trusted advisor and not just another salesperson, right? Not just a vendor. So I know that was a lot in a, you know, a short amount of time, but I certainly would love to open it up to uh, some questions if you guys have it. Everybody can go off mute. Scott, Scott I'll, I, you hit on something I think that, that troubles us all. And, um, you know, we, we all struggle in terms of dealing with it, right? The, the whole idea of, um, you know, we need to do the follow-up. We need to, you know, you call, you email, um, and you're not getting through it. And they ghost you. And so are there suggestions on the message left when we when we call and leave that voicemail and you know because we got we got their voicemail now we're, we're leaving a message versus hey i'm just calling the follow-up 
or yeah. email. Hey, I, I've been trying to reach you and I'm just trying to follow up. And is there some other suggestion or messaging that can be used other than I'm just calling to follow up? Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you for asking that. And um, I did this type of presentation for a, a large corporation and the VP of sales asked me the same exact question. And his name was Matt. And I said, Matt, I'm going to answer that question, but you might not like what I'm going to say. Because he his exact question was, what words can we use instead of just? And my answer to him was, if we follow the process the right way, if we follow a good, strong process and do a great job qualifying, there won't be any need to get ghosted because I'm going to hold you accountable. Now, at the end of the day, prospects still might lie to you, right? But I'm not going to give you the chance to ghost me because I'm going to make sure that when I'm talking to you, if you say, Scott, this all sounds really interesting. I want to talk to a couple of my salespeople. Why don't you do this? Uh, why don't you give me a call next week sometime? I'm not going to settle for that. I'm going to push you uh, nurturingly. And I'm going to say, Angela, listen, I understand. I'll absolutely call you next week, but I find it work. It's so much more effective if we can open up our calendars right now, get that date and time set on the calendar so we're not playing phone tag or we're not exchanging emails and missing each other. Is it okay if we you know, take a moment, open up those calendars, let's get a date on there now and I'll send you a Zoom invite uh, or I'll send you a calendar invite for that call, right? And if they say, no, just call me, then prepare to be ghosted. But if they say, yes, absolutely, let's do that. You get that date on the calendar and then you're not chasing and then you're following it up and you're setting that up for a contract, right? Because if you as a salesperson give your prospect permission to tell you, you no, know, so if I was coming in to meet with you, Angelo, I would say, Angelo, you know what? Let's just make sure that at the end of our conversation, we discuss together if this is a good fit for you. And if for any reason whatsoever, Angelo, you don't think this is a good fit for you, I want you to feel comfortable telling me that. It's okay. No's are good. To me, no stands for next opportunity, right? So, you know, I don't want to chase you. I don't want to send you all these emails and, vo and voicemails. So I want you to feel comfortable telling me no if it is going to be a no. And I've never had anybody tell me, oh, you know what, Scott? It was going to be a yes, but because you told me it's okay to tell you no, it's a no. Never going to happen. Make them comfortable telling you no because your time is too valuable to chase. But like I said, some clients, some prospects will still lie to you. They'll set up that meeting and then they won't show up for it, right? Then you know real quickly that they're not a good fit for you. Other questions? Scott, John LeMake, um, make sure I'm off mute here. I am. Um, so, so all the steps you, you talked about, right? That first step was building rapport, talking to that person, building that relationship. Is there anything in the program or how do you differentiate? How do we get to that point? Do we say, oh, that, that's marketing's job. We don't, we don't generate, we, we don't go out and, and make cold calls or, or knock it on doors. That's not how we're generating the leads to actually find the people we're building the rapport with who actually have an interest. And I, I, I kind of lump that in with prospecting myself, right? How are we actually finding people? What are some ways to, that work today? You know, we hear a lot about social media. We hear about things like email marketing may or may not be dead. Cold calling may or may not be dead. What is that earlier part of the sales process and how does Sandler handle that? Yeah, so that's more, yeah, that, so that's more like lead gen, finding the right people to talk to, right? You're, you're spending your time in your areas of highest potential. And the way that is handled, really a prospecting plan needs to contain a bunch of different activities, a bunch of different behaviors. So normally when someone says to me, they talk about prospecting and why they don't do it is because they automatically associate prospecting with cold calling and they hate doing it. It's talking to strangers. They don't want to get hung up on. A good, strong, cohesive prospecting plan needs to have quite a few different things in there, but you have to have the conviction that over time it's all going to work. And you have to stick with it. You can't do it one day and then expect the world to change, right? Your prospecting plan should consist of a certain amount of cold calls. It should consist of social media. It should consist of some LinkedIn work. It should consist of some asking for referrals and, and warm calls. It should consist of um, cold email strategies, warm email strategies, video emails, right? Trying to be different, but you want to do those four or five different things every day. And you want to calendar the time aside to do it. Because when people do things that they don't necessarily like, like cold calls, 
they will they will discover that they have avoidance behavior, right? So they might say, they might pick up the phone and say, all right, I'm gonna make a cold call today. I call John LeMay. Hey, John, Scott Bliss with Chandler Training. Click. Oh, great. Then I call Denise. Hey, Denise, Scott Bliss with it. Click. Oh, right now, I know I wanna make four, five, six, 10 more calls, but my mindset is that it doesn't work, right? And all of a sudden my phone bleeps and it says, oh, Marina liked my post on Facebook. Let me let me go on Facebook. I'll get back to these cold calls later. Let me go on Facebook for a little bit. Or uh, a customer emailed me that they're having a delivery issue. Let me go work on that for a while, right? I'll go back to prospecting later. And then you never go back to prospecting, right? So your plan should be conducive of calls, emails, video emails, LinkedIn, social media, referrals, it should be conducive of all of that, but you need to stick to it because it's not going to happen overnight. LinkedIn is. Scott, yeah, Scott, you forgot. You forgot to mention attending the chamber meetings. Attend networking, absolutely. Networking. The number one reason why people don't uh, renew at chambers or any other networking, they join, they show up to one or two things over the course of the year. Business doesn't come to them, so they quit. You got to put yourself out there a little bit. You got to show up to events like this. You got to go to the to the breakfast. You got to go to the after hours things. And really, at the end of the day, while it's great if we can sell to everybody in the chambers, not everybody in the chamber is going to have a need for your product or service. So you shouldn't be joining these networking groups essentially just to sell the people in the room. The great part about it is not the people in the room, but who they know. Right. So Mark Ramos might not be a candidate for me right, for my training. But I might say to Mark, hey, Mark, are there any business owners that you know of that maybe I should have a conversation with? And all I'm looking for Mark to do there is maybe arrange the referral. I'm not looking for him to qualify the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking for him to say, yeah, you know what? Uh, I, my friend Bob Smith is a VP of sales for this company. I'll send him an email and I'll copy you. I just want that introduction because I might get a better shot at it. If I'm calling up Bob Smith, hey, it's Bob, hey, Bob it's Scott with Chandler Training. Right. I might get further along with Bob if I say, Mark Ramos told me to give you a call. Right. So that's all part of it as well. I know we're over time. I can stay and answer some more questions if you'd like. But that's up I to you. Scott, I have included your email here on the chat if anybody wants to, to reach out or through us. And I will you know, put you in connection. I know Denise is going to send an email to thank everyone and include the recording too. So um, anyone else has a question right now, a quick one? I have a comment. Sure. Please. So Scott, the, and I know I came on uh, a, a bit late and I apologize for that, but I, I have to say that after 40 years uh, on the sales floor, um, selling appliances, everything that you said is absolutely correct and in the order that you presented. So. Um, Congratulations on that. It's uh, if you guys are first timers and, and dealing with Scott, believe everything he said and put it to use for you. There's no difference whether you're selling on the sales floor or uh, you're selling in somebody else's office. It uh, just maintain those uh, those thoughts that he gave you today. Awesome, thank you, Ralph. And you all, by the way, for attending today's session. Um, you all uh, can join one of my training classes as my guest, free of charge. Uh, just shoot me an email and we'll decide which class is best for you to sit in on. But uh, you're all welcome to uh, to be my guest in one of our training sessions. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. Thank right. you. Everyone. Thank you, Scott, for today. Thank you to all who's joining us. Very informative and detailed um, presentation. Um, Next one, it will be the next strategies for success will be September 9, um, your life, your legacy um, with me and to Mary from Delia Funeral Home. So um, that will be it for today. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Scott. Thank right. you. Thank Thanks, you. Again. Thanks, Scott. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Welcome. Don't forget Member Connect tomorrow, guys. Thank Got you. It. Yep. Member Connect tomorrow. Pretty cool. Wow. Okay, you can stop recording, Denise.